So we are, um, and it's different sitting down when I'm by myself too. I almost feel like I'm being lazy sitting here instead of standing up when I'm by myself, but we'll see if it works. Uh, we are going to be in Isaiah 40 tonight, and um, we'll see how far we get. I'll just say that. This, uh, the curriculum, once again, is we're back to using a kind of a prepared curriculum that is on, available on the ebiblestudy.org <coughs> website, which is a website that it, it is overseen under the domain of Oklahoma Christian. Um, uh, Stafford North was the one that originally started all that. I don't think there's anything being added to it anymore. I think that's kind of gone, that they're maintaining what they have, but I don't think there's anything else to be written. Um, but they are uh, good. The material that we've used from this website in the past has been very, very good. And uh, we concluded the first Isaiah study several months ago, and now we're, we're into the second uh, part of the book of Isaiah. Uh, so we'll be in Isaiah today. Harold Shank is the one who authored all of these lessons, and he titled this one, The God Who Cares Like a Shepherd and Soars Like an Eagle. Um, so a familiar passage for us at the end of Isaiah 40, if we make it that far tonight. We'll see how we do. Um, a couple of things that I really like about the way he organizes his lessons, and this probably coming from the, the teacher part of me, is uh, it starts off with some objectives. It's nice to know what the, what the point of the lesson is. Why are we doing this? So why are we uh, looking at Isaiah chapter 40 tonight, and what do we hope to get out of our study of Isaiah chapter 40 tonight? So the three objectives for this study is the student can state some of the reasons for studying the book of Isaiah, and those kind of apply not specifically just to chapter 40, but some broad reasons of why we're getting back into this study after we took a break from it. And then the student will explain the broad historical background of the book of Isaiah, which we've already delved into some, and we reviewed a little bit last week, but, um, but there's a shift, just like there's a shift in the content of, of the things that are taking place in the first 39 chapters compared to the remaining chapters of the book. Uh, there's, there's sort of a shift in the, the historical background that we need to, to consider as we make sense of those chapters. And then finally, the student will explain the role Isaiah 40 plays in describing the nature of God. And we'll see more about that here real quick. So in regards to that first objective, why study the book of Isaiah? Well, I mean, other than the obvious, because it's in the Bible, which is um, one of those Sunday school answers I used to talk to the teenagers about years ago. And, you know, there are certain, certain answers that when I ask a question, you can throw these answers out there and they're always going to be right. Like, why do we do this? Because the Bible says so. That's Sunday school answer number one, okay? So you get that one, that's freebie. And then, uh, you know, because the Bible said so, or because uh, because God said so, or because Jesus is the Son of God, you know, those are just like basic, your Sunday school answers that you can always get those right without really having to think about it. But why do we, in 21st century America, want to study the book of Isaiah? Well, let's look at some reasons. Um, it's because Jesus did, and, and we don't necessarily need to look at all of these passages if you open up the, the lesson that, um, that he provides and, and prints out. He has a whole series of scriptures that go, kind of go along with each of these points. Um, many of these passages would be very familiar um, if, if we open them up and look at them, um, you know, things where, where Jesus says, um, you know, there are, your, your ears are are deaf since you cannot hear, and your eyes are blind since you cannot see. I mean, that, that's an Isaiah quotation. And so Jesus knew the book of Isaiah and was able to quote from it and use those passages in, um, in his own ministry. Well, that's a reason for us to study Isaiah. Jesus was familiar with Isaiah. He, he used the book of Isaiah in his own teaching. And then you can expand that, not that to just Jesus, but the gospel writers did in their own um, uh, in their own writing in, in reference to Jesus, but not necessarily the words that Jesus spoke, not quoting Jesus as Jesus quotes Isaiah, but quoting Isaiah themselves as they talk about Jesus. And that gives us passages like Matthew chapter 1, where I, uh, Matthew quotes from the book of Isaiah to talk about, you know, a virgin would give birth, and, um, and, and that goes back to Isaiah, and, and Matthew, through the Holy Spirit, puts that in reference to Jesus. And so the, the gospel writers quoted often from Isaiah and used the information that they knew from Isaiah to establish who Jesus was and that he was a fulfillment of the prophecies that Isaiah had given. Um, we have that same thing in, in uh, 
the, the epistles of the New Testament, the other writings of the New Testament, specifically Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 6, um, you have Paul talking about the gospel armor. And if you go back and look at Isaiah chapter 59, Paul's verbiage there is very similar to some of the things that Isaiah says. He, so Isaiah talks about a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation. Um, and, and so Paul is using that same language that Isaiah used um, to make New Testament points. And so Paul was familiar with Isaiah. Um, so I'm surprised considering that Paul was a Pharisee and he was a, you know, a very devout Jew. And so he was familiar with those, um, uh, with those writings. Uh, we know that other early Christians did. We have a story in Acts chapter 8 of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch where Philip was sent down to, to the road uh, in Gaza and, and he met up with the eunuch as he was traveling south back into Ethiopia and uh, preached to him from the book of Isaiah and starting at the scripture that he was at in the book of Isaiah, preached Jesus to him. And that's an amazing thing to think about. If you consider if I want to teach somebody about Jesus today, I'm as a, as a, you know, living in the time that we live in and with my knowledge and understanding of the Bible, I'm probably not going to start in Isaiah. Not that I wouldn't use Isaiah, but, but would I have the ability to start with Isaiah and, and teach somebody everything they need to know about Jesus uh, to the point where they accept that information and they're ready to be baptized? And so um, Philip knew Isaiah very well uh, so that he could explain the book of Isaiah in such a way that it pointed to Jesus. Uh, in the, the context of what happened in Acts chapter 8. There are over 100 quotes in the New Testament from the book of Isaiah. It's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. Um, Psalms and Deuteronomy are, uh, are up there as well, but um, Isaiah with over 100 quotes in the New Testament make it important for us to know, to know Isaiah so that when we see those quotations and those references in the New Testament, they have some context. We have an understanding of why a New Testament writer is using that passage or where the New Testament writer got that information to be able to make that quotation or make that point that they're making. Um, if we don't understand Isaiah, then we miss out on some of the depth, the breadth, the meaning that we can get from the New Testament writers. So anytime we open an Old Testament book and we dive into it and, and really try to go deep into the study of that book, it's only going to enhance and, and illuminate our understanding of the New Testament. Um, and so it's a, a very worthy and valuable um, study for us to undertake today. Um, another one that he had in there, and, and I think this one is <coughs> this one is interesting to me, and, I, and I, I'm not sure if it, if it rises to the, uh, to the level of importance of the other ones, but it is an interesting point. Um, you probably are all have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you're, you're aware of the kind of the story around those in the late 1940s, a, a little shepherd boy threw a rock into a cave, and he heard some sounded like breaking glass and so he went in to see what he had broken and he found some pottery shards and, and inside these little pottery bottles there were some scrolls wrapped up and he didn't know what they were. He probably couldn't even read. And he took them to somebody and they took them to somebody else and they ended up making their way to a museum curator and before you knew it they had discovered that these were scrolls that were nearly 2,000 years old. They had been lost in this cave forever and so they they went back and they started excavating all of these caves and they found hundreds of documents, some of them very, very complete. And one of the very first ones, one of the ones that that shepherd boy found was the great Isaiah scroll. It was a complete scroll of Isaiah. And it dates back to 100 BC. It dates back to older than Jesus. And the thing that's remarkable about that is until that time, the oldest copy of the Old Testament text was from about the year 1080. And so we took a leap back in time, 1100 years by that one discovery to find a text that was 1100 years older than the oldest known text we had at that moment. And the question was, how, how good is the text that we have? After 1100 years, how close do they match up? And the answer is really, really close. They're, they're, the differences are, are very, very minor considering the amount of time that, that elapsed. Things like different spellings of cities and different spellings of people's names and sometimes a verse that is a, a, a line longer or a line shorter or uh, a different arrangement of verses. Ours maybe are, you know, three verses come before those next three but in the, uh, 
uh, you know, in the older scroll, they're in the reverse order. Um, those are the kind of differences that we're talking about after 1,100 years. And, and so, uh, Greg? You know, the other thing that's really cool about that is, um, is one of the criticisms that could be laid that all these messianic prophecies were written after Christ had died. Right. And, and this one shows that Isaiah was written way before Christ right. existed. And, uh, Absolutely. It's really faith building. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely. Um, there were there were no additions made to the Isaiah scroll after Jesus to try to corroborate the New Testament writers using Isaiah to, to make claims about Jesus fulfilling those prophecies. Um, and and there's if you go on to the the Isaiah scroll and all these Qumran texts are in the Jerusalem Museum. If you go onto their website, I don't read Hebrew. This looks to me like it's upside down and backwards. Um, but this is the Isaiah scroll and. Um, it, the, and so the part right there at the top of the page if you hover over it actually lets you click on a verse by verse of the actual Isaiah scroll and not every verse is, is like this I kind of scroll through some places but this is the verse it's Isaiah 40 verse 31 right there and, and, and listen to it it says but those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength then they will ascend with wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will march and not faint that's the same thing that we have. That's the, it's the same words. And we went from a text that in 1945, they, had, they could go back to the year 1000 AD, and in 1950, they could go back to the year 100 BC, and those texts are the same. And that is a, a remarkably faithful thing um, for us to consider. And, and Isaiah is by far the most complete text uh, that was found at Qumran. Uh, in those Dead Sea Scrolls. So, like I said, I, that, that to me is a very interesting thing to think about, look at, and, and the history of it is fascinating. Um, and I think it is faith building. I'm not sure that as we go back to the, the points that we're making there about why we study Isaiah, that it rises to the, to the level of the other ones. But it does affirm all of those other ones, and it, and it, um, it emboldens us in our uh, duty to, to observe those other ones, I think. Um, so anyway, why should we study Isaiah? That was objective number one. I think we've seen some, some good reasons for us to study Isaiah. Uh, getting into the theme, one of the central themes of the book of Isaiah is the nature of God and how he relates to his people. In Isaiah chapter 1, as the, the introductory chapter to that, that section of text that we looked at in our last study, the first 39 chapters, uh, chapter 1 sort of serves as an introduction to that entire section and lays out some things about God's nature. We talked about those things. God is the, the ideal father and Israel is the unfaithful son. And God is the, the loving husband and, I, and Israel is the unfaithful wife and the physician and the, and the patient. You know, those relationships. It told us about the nature of God and that gives the context of, of then the things that unfold historically and um, and related to the narrative of the things that, that we read about in those chapters, it's within that context of, of that's God's nature. Um, and so Isaiah 40 sort of serves that way again for us as we kind of get into a new section of Isaiah and the background, the historical setting changes a little bit for us. Um, we need to re-examine God's character. We need to re-examine God's nature. Is this still the same God that we, that we saw in the first 39 chapters? Has God changed somehow? Or have just the, the circumstances changed, the historical setting changed? Um, and so that's a, an important thing for us to consider as we read through here. Uh, it's important for us to understand the, the scope of, um, of the geography of what's taking place in these uh, last uh, section, or last chapters of Isaiah. Um, in the first 39 chapters, I, I always have trouble doing this backwards here, the first 39 chapters, we really focused around Jerusalem and sort of the nations that surrounded Jerusalem. And we got up into Assyria up here a little ways, and we talked a little bit about Egypt down here. But really it was focused on this area. Um, we're going to expand that now to being uh, considering Babylon in this one. And um, there's some remarkable things to consider about um, the fact that we're expanding our, our frame of reference to include Babylon at this point. Uh, number one, Babylon wasn't really that big of a threat at this point. When Isaiah is alive and Isaiah is writing, Babylon is just kind of getting 
onto the world stage. And we still have the two major powers being Assyria and Egypt. So why do we really care about Babylon at this point? Babylon is kind of off the radar. Uh, but Isaiah puts them on the radar by the things that he says and, and uh, by the way that he writes about what Babylon is going to do 100 years from now, um, which how could he have known that? Um, could, unless God was the source of that information. So uh, there is a shift from kind of the local kingdoms around to more of a, a world stage where Babylon is going to become a major power. Um, and here are some of those passages that we can look at real quick. Um, we have some clear references that the people in, uh, that the people that Isaiah is addressing are people that are in Babylonian captivity. No Jews are in Babylonian, Babylonian captivity at the time of Isaiah's writing. But Isaiah is writing to people who are in captivity. Let that sink in. He's writing to, think, to people who are going to be experiencing things that haven't happened yet. And so um, that, that's an important point for us to understand as we read through there. So chapter 43, verse 14, thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. He's going to bring about the destruction of Babylon. Why do we care? Babylon is not a thing yet. Uh, but Babylon is going to come along and they're going to do some things that anger God and God is going to humble them. And if you remember back to our study of Daniel and Ezekiel and, uh, and some of those other prophets, we know that eventually God does that uh, because of Babylon's, uh, because of their actions. Another passage, Isaiah 48, verse 20. Um, Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, declare with the sound of joyful shouting, proclaim this, Send it out to the end of the, the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Jacob is redeemed from what? They're not in captivity at the time of Isaiah's writing. But Isaiah is writing to them as though they are in captivity to a kingdom that really hasn't even come, come into their own power yet. And so it's, a, a again, a, a, a focusing of our, of our attention in a direction that you would not expect it to be focused. Uh, because we, we can't see this coming unless we have divine knowledge of something. And then uh, 49, 21, and, and 22 says, Then you will say in your heart, Who has begotten these for me since I have been bereaved of my children? And a barren, an exile, and a wanderer, who has reared these? Behold, I was left alone. From where did these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. And so there it is. They've been bereaved of their children. And if we go into the future and we look at the siege of Jerusalem and how the people are carried off into captivity, Isaiah is talking about things that haven't yet happened. Uh, and then finally, chapter 51, verses 10 and 11. And there are others that, that he listed, others we could look at as well, but, uh, but these suffice as, a, as a, uh, an example of some of the passages that point us to this historical background. And it's interesting to call it historical background. It's really historical foreground. Um, it, it hasn't happened yet, but Isaiah is writing about it as though it has happened. Uh, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, and everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and Zion will flee away. And that's almost some of the exact same language that the captives who return from Babylonian captivity use to describe the things that they feel as they're returning uh, to Jerusalem after captivity. And so um, Isaiah prophesies there or, or uh, foretells the idea of them returning from captivity. Uh, while we're reading through the, and, and this specifically, this, this first part of the study is dedicated to chapters 40 through 55, and those 16 chapters sort of form, form a block of, um, of specific prophecies and things that Isaiah is going to bring about uh, or bring to our attention. So the people in Babylon in captivity will fall, fall into three categories during this time. There will be those who are assimilated, those who are in despair, and those who are hopeful. And the assimilated, these are people who basically embrace captivity. Um, some begin to live and to think like their captors, including adopting Babylonian gods. 
And Isaiah has something to say about those who would go into captivity and would embrace the lifestyle that their captors uh, that, that their captors live. And Babylon was one of those nations where under Assyrian captivity, they specifically wanted their captives to assimilate. They, they took measures to enforce assimilation upon their, their uh, captives. Babylon had a very different approach to taking their captives in. They would set them up in their own camps. They would set them up amongst their own people, and they would allow them to retain their own identities. That's why you have um, Ezekiel and Daniel able to, to sort of observe all of their own religious practices and all of those things uh, during captivity because the Babylonians encouraged them to keep their own identity just within the context of you're going to live in our nation and do it. You're going to, to use your um, you're going to use your customs to build up our nation. And so think about those then that would have the opportunity to retain their own beliefs, their own means of, of worship, their own identities, but would choose to give those up in order to follow after the identities of their captors. That's, that's not a good thing. And so they are willingly giving up um, who God has called them to be to chase after uh, Babylonian identity. There are those who were in despair. And I think I finally now am to, uh, have, I, have I missed any of the blanks on the worksheet? If you had any of those, by the way, there are worksheets now that uh, since he prepares them, I can get them printed. Uh, but uh, should be a blank on the worksheet for this one. Um, some of the negative, uh, some were negative and fearful about the fact that they were in captivity. They felt abandoned by God. They felt that they had been forsaken. Um, and, and they wondered if God even heard their prayers anymore. Does, is there, does God listen? Can he do anything about it? Is he powerful enough to act? Does he care enough about us to act? Um, those kind of things are going to be dealt with by, by Isaiah. Um, we've got to minister to the people who are in despair. We can't let them live in that despair. We have to provide answers for them so that we can bring them out of that despair. Um, and then it looks like I missed, oh man, what's number three? Uh, number three was uh, those who are hopeful, and those are the people we want to be. And is there a blank there? Because I forgot to put in that slide, evidently. All right. Uh, you kind of know what hopeful means. Go back to the questions from the exiles. Go back to which one? The questions from the exiles. Maybe you weren't there yet on the slide. I see. I think I went forward. This one? No. I don't know. Oh, I, yeah, two questions. I'll get there. Okay, uh, that's next. I can see it next. So God, um, basic outline of chapter 40 is divided into two sections. Um, there's going to be three voices that speak in the first 11 verses. And then in the, the um, you know, this is my favorite part, um, Isaiah's three-point sermon about God um, in the verses 12 through 31. And um, that three-point sermon, that really gets into the idea of the nature of God that we talked about, that this, this chapter serves as an introduction to this whole section, and we've got to address God's nature. Who is God, um, and and why are we even why are we even talking about it? So, um, so we're going to get into that with Isaiah's sermon. So, Isaiah addresses two questions regarding the nature of God. Does God have the power to act, and does God care about us? And those are, I mean, two distinct questions. It'd be one thing if God, yeah, He has the power to do something about our situation. He just doesn't care. Um, he's going to let us suffer, and so what? Doesn't, doesn't really affect him or harm him, or, you know, he just kind of turns a blind eye to our suffering. That tells us something about God, if that's who God is. He has the power, he just doesn't care. Or maybe God really, really cares, and he really wishes he could do something about it, but he doesn't have the power to do anything about it. Because, you know, the Babylonians, they have their gods. And the Assyrians have their gods, and the Egyptians have their gods, and if our God is just one among many, and he really is no more powerful than any of those others, well, that, I mean, that's probably something we need to know as well. And so, um, does he have the power, and does he care? Those are the things that Isaiah uh, is going to address in chapter 40. So, we're ready now for the text. We're going to study Isaiah 40, and we're, you know, 30 minutes in, and now we're ready to actually look at Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, Justin would be proud. All right. Um, first two verses, Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. 
Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so um, the first voice here is what we have. Um, and that first voice, uh, there, there are going to be three announcements uh, given by God. And sometimes I think I should bring up one of the things I print out for you guys to look at. I did bring out one of those, so let me find it in here. Um, uh, the first voice, uh, you know, lets us know that uh, Jerusalem is, is, first of all, Jerusalem is likely a term used to describe people in exile. Um, you know, we've seen that before. We saw that in the first section where we talked about Ephraim. Um, was a euphemism for the northern kingdom. And, and we talked about Jerusalem was, uh, you know, we talked about Jerusalem, but that means the entire southern kingdom. So here in this section is we're talking about people who are in captivity, um, in Babylonian captivity, and we call them Jerusalem. We need to understand that they are in captivity, and we're referring to them um, as just as the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Um, so what three commands does God give there? He, he says for them to comfort, um, comfort my people, uh, to speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to Jerusalem. And think about in the context of, of people that are in captivity, um, how those things would reach out to be a, a comfort to them, how it would reach out to, to um, you know, buoy them up or to, to, uh, to encourage them during their time of captivity. Uh, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her. So um, the, the idea of, of, that we saw in the first 39 chapters was that there was a time to talk about punishment. There was a time to talk about restoration. And you talk about punishment while there's still something that can be done. Like if, if you don't get your act together, here are the consequences that are going to take place. Um, once you're into that realm of consequences and you're into the paying the price for what you've done, it's not really beneficial to continue talking about the punishment. The punishment is now being enacted. The punishment is taking effect. And so now what we need to talk about is restoration. We need to talk about um, you know, rejuvenation and redemption. And that's kind of the, the tact that Isaiah is taking from the beginning here. You might say, well, Isaiah is talking to people that are not in captivity yet. No, he's talking to people that are in captivity. They're not there yet, but he's talking to them that are in captivity down the road. And so the people need to understand that um, God has made up his mind. This is what's about to happen. And, and you're not going to change the outcome of what's about to happen because your sins have gotten to the point that uh, God has decided that punishment is coming. And so now we have to move to a new frame of reference. We have to move to a new new direction that says, what do we what do we do to bring about uh, an end to that punishment, or what do we do to bring about um, restoration after that punishment takes place? So he is speaking comfort. He's speaking tenderly. Uh, he is crying out to Jerusalem. Uh, those of you who have children that have been through that, you know, those toddler years, those young years when when you have to administer the. Uh, you know, the, the swats or the spankings or the timeout or the sit in the corner or, or whatever that is, you know there's a time for restoration after that takes place. You don't just leave your child there crying on the bed and never go and talk to them, never go and, and have a, a moment of reconciliation with them after that discipline has taken place. And so Isaiah is giving them that reconciliation uh, through this first voice that takes place. Um, there, there's also three announcements that are made in this first section. Uh, the three announcements that come as the, you know, after the, the first, uh, the first things are said is that the war is over. Um, the people are forgiven and their double suffering is over. And, and well, what is double suffering? How have they suffered doubly? Think about the conclusion of captivity. Think about not where they're at when Isaiah is speaking, but think about him writing to them at the conclusion of their captivity. What have they been through that's unthinkable? What have they lost? It's really big. Temple. Temple. I mean, 
mean, they they lost everything. By the time by the time restoration takes place, by the time they come back from captivity, it's not just that they've been lost the war and they've gone into captivity. They've lost the war, they've gone into captivity, and the temple's gone. And that is unthinkable. And so, you know, there's there's punishment. And again, back to the parent illustration, you know, there's there's punishment that you can talk to your kids about. That if you make this decision, here's what the punishment is going to be. And sometimes, you know, you can see them weighing it. It's like, huh, is it worth it? You know, he said, you know, I'll be grounded for a week. Is it worth it to be grounded for a week to go ahead and do what I wanted to do? You know, then maybe that punishment wasn't enough. But to tell the Israelites before it happens that the temple is going to be lost, they can't bear that. They, they think that is a punishment that can't be undone. But God has to minister to them. God has to provide a restoration for them even after the unthinkable happens. Um, so the war is over. The people are forgiven. And their double suffering is over. Um, there will be restoration after, um, after captivity. Um, next section here, verses 3 through 5. A voice is calling clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough around become rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, um, we're talking here about the removal of obstacles. By the way, does that passage sound familiar? Where, where does this apply to the New Testament? John the Baptist. We just saw that in our study of John, the early chapters of John. You know, he was he was uh, a voice crying in the wilderness, make way, make make straight the path of the Lord. Um, and so, so that is the removal of obstacles before Jesus, as he uh, is the way that that was applied to John. And many of the things that we'll see in in Isaiah that are prophetic things about Jesus have a fulfillment, of course, in Jesus or in the life of Jesus. But they also have a fulfillment immediately in the, the time of of the the people of Babylon are the people that, that Isaiah was writing to. And in this case, he is writing about the removal of obstacles uh, for restoration. And so how, how do you take somebody into captivity, destroy their society, destroy their nation, destroy their temple, destroy their religion, destroy all of this stuff, and then talk about restoration? How does restoration take place after all of that destruction has taken place? Well, there's a a lot of political and geographical and financial and, and issues that have to be addressed in order for, for restoration to happen. And all of those are obstacles. And Isaiah is going to address specifically some of those obstacles, specifically to the point of naming the king that is going to be the one to restore. So, you know, there are, there are big obstacles that stand in the way of restoration, but God has thought all of this through. And he's got a plan for restoration. And we're going to take care of those obstacles. Um, there are also going to be some of, of the exiles that resist God's plan all along the way. I, I, you probably can't imagine that there were people that resisted God's plan every step of the way. Uh, but there were. And some of those things are going to be addressed along the way as well. Those are obstacles that have to be dealt with. Um, and this is then, with the removal of those obstacles, we have the announcement that God is going to bring his people home. And what, a, what, a, what a promise that is, that in the midst of, of captivity, I'm going to bring you home. And then uh, the next section there, verses uh, 6 through 8, a voice calls out. Um, so that was, uh, were we still, we were still in our voice. Oh, the voice, voice one was verse 6. Sorry, I got to go back and look. Okay, so I think I said voice one uh, at the beginning, but this is voice one. That's why I thought my slides were out of order. Um, so vo voice two comes in with verses six through eight. It says, a voice calls out, then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Does any of that sound familiar, by the way? I think you'll find that is it's either first or second Peter. Peter quotes these passages and talks about uh, the word of the Lord standing forever. 
Um, so we have another quotation there from the New Testament. Um, and here we have voice two, and voice two, it says, you know, God calls out, or, or God asks basically, is, is there someone to speak for me? And a voice calls out, what do you want me to say? And so the voice is given its words, uh, which is an illustration for us of the power of God's words, this, this mysterious voice or this uh, disembodied voice um, wants to speak, but it waits for the message. It's not going to speak of its own volition. It's going to speak only what God tells it to speak. And so this message then from God uh, has to do with uh, the exiles being compared to, uh, to withering grass. And it has to do with dependability. Remember, we're talking about the nature of God in this section. So um, you might think that a God who has allowed his people to be trundled off into captivity, allowed the temple to be destroyed, allowed all of this bad stuff to happen, maybe that's not a very dependable God. Um, but we need to get that right. It's the people that were under, not dependable. Undependable? Um, the people were not dependable, but God is dependable. And when God promises restoration, then that restoration is sure. It's going to happen. Um, so God's word, only God's word is dependable. And we see that as a major recurring theme. Um, I think we've already seen it through some of the things that we've read early in earlier chapters. And we will continue to see that as we read through uh, future chapters, that God's word is dependable. Um, and then verses 9 through 11, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will, lead, he will gently lead the nursing ewes. Again, some illustrations or some points there in that section that are familiar to our New Testament ears, I think, uh, as we talk about the, the idea of good news, as we talk about the shepherd and the gently leading the lambs and those things. Um, those are just familiar, uh, familiar illustrations that we're used to seeing in the New Testament. And they are references back to passages that we see that day. So voice three, um, the exiles resist the news that God will bring them home. Um, and by the way, that phrase, good news, what, what do we call the good news? The gospel. It's the gospel. And, and it's a related word. This, of course, written not in Greek, where we would find the New Testament word for gospel being the good news, but it's a related word. It's you know, the same, uh, same etymology that, that we would translate that word good news. And if you read... The, the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures, it would be the same word that we have in the New Testament for gospel. Um, so it is, it is God's good news that, that release from captivity is coming. Well, what is the gospel to us? It's the good news about Jesus Christ, the, the release of our captivity to sin. It is, it is the good news. And so there's a, a parallel there between what this voice is bringing to the people in Babylonian captivity and what uh, we have in the New Testament with God um, announcing the good news of his son to deliver us from our sins. Uh, and this voice announces several key qualities of God. Um, and this answers some of those questions that we talked about. Uh, God, God is coming. He's not going to leave them. He's not, he has not abandoned them. God, God is, is coming. He is going to be there for them in captivity. He is powerful. There's no question that he has the ability to relieve them from captivity. He does care, and he removes their fear. And so all of these things reveal to us something of God's quality, something of his character, something of his nature. And um, that's important for us to know as we begin to consider the idea that we're going to be in captivity. There's nothing we can do about that at this point. It's coming. But we don't give up on God because of it. We don't, we don't feel abandoned by God because of it, and we don't abandon our faith in God because of it. Um, God, here in this section, God, uh, or Isaiah describes God for the doubter in exile. So the, the exile, um, the person in exile that doubts uh, that God cares, that doubts that God is powerful enough, that thinks that God is, has um, abandoned them. He, he announces that God is willing to care for the people, that God is powerful enough to rescue, and that there is no one like God. And these thoughts serve then as an introduction to the three-point sermon that follows. Um, 
that's kind of kind of the introductory uh, little section there before we get into the meat of the lesson. John, I think one of the things that we need to we need to get out of this, and and he's trying to explain to them, but not saying it like that, is that this is on God's terms and God's timing, not on their timing. And we want it to happen now. It's got to come when God wants to come. Yeah. It, absolutely. It, this, yeah, this all is going to happen according to God's plan, and that has to do with, with him being powerful enough. Um, their captivity itself is not evidence of God lacking power, and them being in captivity and remaining in captivity for a generation or two is not indicative of God not having any power. You know, God... All of this is under the umbrella of God is powerful enough to do what God wants to do. He is sovereign. And so establishing God's authority and God's power uh, is an important point for Isaiah to get across to the people because they, they it, it does us no good to believe in God that is weak. Yeah. Um, okay, our first section, verses 12 through 17. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Um, this is a, a fascinating section of scripture. And this, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get started talking about this point. God is incomprehensible. And it's interesting that I don't want to spend time talking about something that we can't comprehend. But um, that's what I do all day. I teach math. So, uh, at least that's what some of my students think. So, God is incomprehensible. Uh, humanity cannot fully comprehend God. And some of those statements there at the beginning of that passage, you know, God um, holds the, um, the, the waters in the palm of his hands. Think about the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Um, I've, I've measured it before, and I can hold almost a tablespoon of water in my hand. I got pretty big hands. A tablespoon. God can hold the waters in the palm of His hand. Um, that that's a big hand. But even bigger than that, He He stretched forth the heavens by the span. That's the span of His hand. And so God held up His hand and said to the to the skies, "Well, that's about big enough. That's about the right size." And, and how big is the sky from one end to the other? Well, we've been, I've been seeing, I don't know why, but I've been seeing all these videos lately on, about this new telescope they launched. And uh, the pictures they're getting back from deep space and how far they can see back in time and how far they can see to the edge of the universe and, and all this stuff. And there are, you know, a trillion galaxies that are, that are able to be, uh, you know, maybe there are a trillion galaxies. Each galaxy has a trillion stars, and that's a, that's a lot of stars. And God held up His hand and said, "That's about right. That's about the right size." Um, that is incomprehensible. That you you can't you can't think that big. You can't. Um, and and for us to consider then that we're going to try to teach God something, or we're going to question Him. Or we're going to question whether or not he's powerful enough to be able to lead us out of captivity. Or that he's, that he's powerful enough to uh, be able to bring about his will here on this planet. Um, if it wasn't so serious, it'd be laughable. It'd be silly for us to think that he's not powerful enough to do those things. Um, he, is, he is powerful enough. And we can see evidence of that power in the creation around us by looking at the fact that those things exist. And I don't, I don't care what anybody with any number of letters after their name says, there is no natural explanation for those things. There's, there's no way to explain it 
without something causing it. And it had to have been God. The only thing big enough to have caused all of those things to happen it has to be God. And then we talk about who God is and what his nature is. And is he a good God or a bad God? Or is he, you know, does he know about us? Does he care about us? I mean, we need to start talking about all those details, but there has to be a God who puts all of that into place. There has to be. Um, and, and so this puts it into kind of puts it into scope for us or puts it into to reference of what we're talking about. Um, Greg? You know, this language just makes me think of when God was talking to Job and his friends. Right. Know, explaining, you know. Yeah. Where were you when I, you know, set the foundations of the earth? When I, yeah. And so uh, after they're, they're giving Job's friends, give Job a, a lesson in morality and a lesson in, in uh, you know, how God works and all these things and and then God shows up and basically tells him, I don't need you to defend me. Yeah. You know, you're you're not getting it right anyway, and, and you you don't understand my nature. So um, you know, we can only understand about God what God has made us made it capable for us to understand about God. Um, and, and so he is he is powerful, he is incomprehensible in his in his power, in his nature, and all of those things. So um, let me see if I missed anything here. He, he put all the water into um, Lebanon, it mentions. It was a heavily forested area, but even if all the trees were cut down for a fire for God's altar, that would be insufficient because God's wisdom is beyond human comprehension. And, and specifically mentions there, you know, God's wisdom, which was referenced there, um, who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding. Um, so the... The idea that we can teach God or that we can instruct God on the things that God should do on our behalf. You know, God, I don't know if you've noticed me down here or not and what I'm going through, but here's what I think you ought to do about it. That's, you know, it, it makes us feel pretty small uh, to think about those things. So uh, the fact that, the fact then that we're going to talk next about that God cares well, you know, we talked about those two uh, those two possibilities. God's powerful enough to act, but he doesn't care. Well, that's not a very good God. And God is cares, but he's not powerful enough to do anything about it. Well, that's, that's not a very impressive God. What really is important is that he's powerful enough and that he cares. And so after we establish that he's powerful enough, um, now we have to answer the question, does he care? Does, does he even notice that we're here. Does he even notice that we're hurting? Does he even notice that we need him? Uh, and that's going to be uh, where we go next. I'm trying to avoid going to the next section because we don't have time to, to talk about it. Uh, so, any final thoughts that we want to get from from this? We'll we'll finish up Isaiah chapter forty next week. Uh, we'll start with verse eighteen and finish that sermon. Isaiah, we get two weeks on a sermon. Is that heard of? Okay, thank you very much.